songs for the stars above. It is an absolute pleasure to introduce our next special guest speaker, Nobuaki Hanaoka. No Nobuaki was an infant when the bomb fell on Nagasaki on August 9th in 1945. His mother and sister died from illness related to radiation poisoning and his brother died at 39 from aging related to the bomb. Reverend Hanaoka is a retired minister in the United Methodist Church who came to the U.S. following ser seminary training in Japan. He is now settled in the Bay Area where he speaks, writes, and teaches on topics of peace and human rights. Please join me in welcoming Nobuaki Hanaoka. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. On August the 9th, 1945, three days after, the first atomic bomb was detonated in the sky above Hiroshima. The second and hopefully the last ever nuclear bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. It was 11.02 a.m. I was only an eight-month-old baby living about 20 miles away from Ground Zero. It is officially outside of the nuclear, effect, nuclear bomb affected area. Obviously, I was not aware of the horrifying inferno unfolding in the city of Nagasaki. Hiroshima bomb was a uranium bomb designed to ease the explosive power of 15 kilotons of TNT. For the Nagasaki bomb was a plutonium bomb designed to release the explosive power of 22 kilotons of TNT. Detonation of these two primitive nuclear bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki resulted in the combined casualties of 214,000 innocent lives, nearly a quarter of a million, according to the official Japanese government count, although the U.S. estimate, official estimate, remains less than one half of the Japanese official count or tally. <coughs> Today, the Hiroshima-Nagasaki-sized nuclear bomb is used only as a trigger mechanism to induce fusion reaction to uh, hydrogen isotopes. While many of the bombs were, we have in the U.S. are designed to yield 10 to 15 megatons, our largest is the 25 megatons which is 25 million tons of TNT. And the largest in the world is the Russian-made Zabamba, which is 50 megatons, 50 million tons of TNT. But these two, or any of these megaton class bombs can do to this earth and to the people in it are unimaginable. Millions will die and millions more will suffer for the rest of their lives from all kinds of illnesses. Basically, there are three ways or three destructive elements in the nuclear bombs. The first is the blast, or the sudden expansion of air caused by the nuclear explosion. The blast was so powerful in both Nagasaki and Hiroshima, they knocked down almost all of the buildings within a few miles from the ground to ground zero, and tens of thousands were crushed to death under the collapsed building or hit by the flying objects. The second is the intense heat. The nuclear explosion
explosion created an enormous fireball whose temperature is twice as hot as the surface of the sun. The fireball ignited the entire city and the fireball kept growing, growing until it engulfed the whole city. Those who were exposed to the fireball were instantly evaporated and many, many others were burned seriously. The doctors and nurses and the first responders were all among the dead. So there's no one to care for the victims, the injured, and they were left unattended for days. Third deadly element of the atom bomb was the most insidious one, radioactive fallout. After the explosion, the invisible radioactive particles quickly spread into the air. They were carried then by the wind to further spread into the atmosphere, the wider area. They came back down with the rain, often called the black rain. It contaminated everything on the, on the ground, including the water reservoirs. Therefore, the water we drank, the air we breathed, the food we ate were all contaminated with radioactive particles. There's no escape from radiation. Once the radioactive particles enter the body, they remain in the bone marrow for many, many, many years, destroying the immune system. That's why many of those who were exposed to radiation eventually succumbed to leukemia or many other forms of cancer. As far back as I can recall, both my mother and sister were in bed looking pale and weak. They were suffering from leukemia. When my father came home from the war, he moved us all out of the radiation-infested area to another city where my, both my mother and sister died. I was six. When my, after my, my sister died, my father asked, wondering what is going to happen to the rest of the family, and the doctor told him, which I was not supposed to hear, that if I was exposed to the same kind of radiation, I would not live to see my 10th birthday. It was, I was totally devastated, confused. And I, I lost my speech. I didn't, I wasn't able to speak a word for a few months. Fortunately, my 10th birthday came and went, and what a relief it was. Obviously, the radiation did not affect me physically, but psychologically, I always lived afraid that radiation might start killing me anytime. But I'm, I'm okay, I'm 74. I'm old enough to live to see you all and speak about it. Nineteen seventy eight, when I was a pastor in Alameda. I met some community leaders and volunteers, and with them organized a group called Friends of Hibaksha, A-bomb survivors. 
Through our activities, I met many survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the local residents in the Bay Area. They all said surviving the nuclear explosion is like living with a time bomb inside your body. You never know when they begin to kill you. They all agreed that those who died quickly in the blast were the lucky ones because they didn't have to suffer such prolonged illnesses, prolonged misery the rest of their lives. If you include those who have since died from the residu residual radiation, like my mother and my sister, the casualties will easily double. Earlier this year, Russia announced that they have deployed SSC-8 cruise missiles equipped with nuclear warheads in violation of the INF Treaty, Inter Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, signed by Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987 and has since been considered a cornerstone of global arms control. Those new hypersonic Russian cruise missiles with land-based mob mobile launchers can reach anywhere in Europe, North Asia, and North, even North America within minutes. They threaten the peace of the entire Northern Hemisphere. You would expect our president to immediately start negotiating with Russia. But instead of engaging Russia in, in negotiation, our president just walked out, walked away from the treaty, thus nullifying our nuclear arms control treatment, uh, treaties for, with Russia. Trump administration sim simply left a treaty as they did with Iran deal. And then he vowed to develop American version of cru cruise missile system. Despite the fact that the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and 191 states have signed it, Despite the fact that in 2017, the Nobel Peace Prize went to a citizens group, international campaign for abol abolition of nuclear weapons. Despite the fact that the United Nations passed a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons in 2017, and 70 states have signed it. Despite all that, we still have an alarming situation that requires our urgent attentions today. Like Maria so ably, accurately described for, the, for us all. The United States has always maintained that our nuclear weapons are for defer, defer, deterrent only. And there is no preemptive strike from the U.S. But the President Trump has said a number of times that the U.S. could and would use nuclear weapons preemptively. That put the rest of the world on edge. He also said that he is determined to keep the U.S. nuclear supremacy. Much like the neocons of decades ago, he still seems to believe that the world peace can be best be maintained by the overwhelming nuclear supremacy of the United States. The opposite is the truth. Our quest for more powerful nuclear weapons results only in the further proliferation of nuclear arms in the rest of the world. The United States, United States has 1,365 nuclear warheads deployed and ready to go, and 3,800 in the stockpile. No wonder Iran and North Korea feel unsafe unless they have their own nuclear power. 
We cannot tell them to disarm while we have thousands of nuclear warheads ready to go. We're still producing more. I suggest that all of us demand our government or United Nations to call all the nine nuclear weapon states to a table of negotiation and start discussing how to disarm, how to eliminate all these weapons simultaneously. Because the survival of human civilization depends on it. Let us remind ourselves again that the nuclear weapons are the most evil, immoral, most inhumane, most heinous, most destructive, indiscriminate murder machine that could ascend the entire planet to the Armageddon. The whole world should scream for the, their complete elimination. Let us renew our commitment today for the vision of a peaceful, compassionate, and nuclear-free world. And let us renew our energy, re-energize our movement for peace and no more nuclear war. There's an organization called Hidankyo, or the Coordinating Committee of A-Bomb Survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They're promoting an international signature campaign for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. And I invite you to visit a table there by the 35 mile power our sign. To visit the table and sign your name to let the whole world know that you are among those who demand a complete elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If we could give one more round of applause to Nobu Aki Hanaoka. Thank you so much for sharing your time and space and energy today and your experience and resilience to inspiration. I want to let down my soul shield inside of a little boy, yeah. Inside of a little boy, yeah. Inside of a little boy. I want to let down my soul shield inside of a little boy. I want to stay with you.